Good to have you back for our online Bible studies. Uh, tonight we start a new series under the main title of The Steps of a Good Man. And that comes from Psalm 37 and verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But to clarify before we go into our study tonight, uh, the reference is not male-centric. It's not just a man, but mankind. So this involves a person, and that involves both men and women. I just wanted to get a focus clear on that. Taking these steps that we're going to look at, uh, we'll develop an understanding, I hope, of the way that God's word encourages us to walk before him and before one another. In fact, walking before all men. We will, in the weeks ahead, look at uh, subjects titled uh, Making Sound Judgments, Release Through Forgiveness, and Coming to Terms with Loss, all under our main heading, The Steps of a Good Man Are Ordered by the Lord. So this study is the introductory one under that main subject uh, from Psalm 37. So what does it mean to be um, a good person uh, under the command of God? We need to examine the, the person before we examine the steps that are being taken. The word in the Hebrew is interesting because the word good that we have is in the original text uh, means valiant. So it's somebody who is uh, courageous, somebody who is bold. Uh, it has some kind of warrior feel about it. Uh, this person is a warrior for truth and uh, righteousness. And that sits in contrast to that which we find in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3, which says, And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for the truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. You can see the picture here of contrast between the one who walks with God and finds that they have a passion for truth and righteousness and the one who is not of God, who is self-centered and only proceeds lie to lie, evil to evil, because they don't know the Lord. So the valiant person, the warrior, is one who stands for truth on the earth amongst us the world really um, and notice that the fullness of grace and truth is found as we're told in John chapter 1 in the person of Christ let me remind you of that text uh, John 1 14 says and the word that's Christ became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory so the word became flesh and we, people, beheld the glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's our benchmark. Jesus is full of grace and truth. And the good person, the valiant person, is one who is not given to lies and deceit. You can't have lies and deceit living with grace and truth. They just will not mix. The good man, then, is one who does not have those elements. He is not given to twisting words to suit his ends or to manipulate circumstances. The truth uh, can sometimes be bent to gain earthly advantages, and that is not the hallmark of a follower of Christ. And uh, we have to be quite strict about that. Um, sometimes we use words like, you know, it was only a little lie. You can't have a little lie. It's a lie or it's not. Uh, sometimes we use the phrase, uh, I was stretching the truth. Both of those things are, are, are contradictory to walking with God in truthfulness. Uh, <clears throat> the man of God, the person of God, the woman of God, has to recognize that there is a war raging, and it's been going on almost forever, uh, against truth the enemy is the father of lies there's no truth in him and he fathers more lies listen to these words in john 8 42 to 45 jesus said to them 
If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So there you can see the origin of lies. It comes from the enemy. The devil is the father of lies. God, our father, is the father of truth. And of course, Jesus, way, the truth and the life. To father something literally means to give life to it. And the devil is a liar and all that he can produce is lies. Seed after its own kind. So the father of lies just keeps producing more lies. If anyone plays into his game, he will manipulate that. And to practice a lie uh, is to defect to the enemy's camp. It's that serious. Lie is not a little lie. There's no such thing as it was just a little lie. A lie is the opposite to truth. And if we de defect to the enemy's camp by lying, he will capitalize on it for sure. The moment someone practices a lie, it takes on a legal right. That lie can feed and nurture all manner of evil, and it will work to its own end. There is a legality issue here. The moment we lie, we enter the enemy's territory, and he will capitalize on it, as I said. We need to recognize the power that exists behind a lie. And we need to understand the ground is a battleground. It really is a war zone. And more ground is lost in the war for righteousness through the tongue than possibly anything else. And I would remind you of James chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. Let me share that with you. It says, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men. And these men have been made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And we get the picture, don't we? You can't have both coming from one source. So with that, where does lie become part of a person? From the father of lies. So the good man, the valiant person, is one who is committed to truthfulness. There is a promise of success and victory in the guarded uh, truthful tongue. It comes from the Lord in Proverbs uh, chapter 12 verse 19 says the truthful lip shall be established forever but a lying tongue is but for a moment there's longevity in truth but a lie will always have its uh, comeuppance if you go down to chapter 22 of the same uh, chap uh, sorry verse 22 of the same chapter it says lying lips are an abomination to the lord but those who deal truthfully are his delight the good person, this warrior, this valiant person, warrior for truth and righteousness, has to be armed for battle. It is a war. You have to fight the good fight of faith. And that person is dressed, ready in the whole armour of God. And our waist, our, our loins, it says in the King James Version, girded with truth. Stand therefore, having girded your waist, with truth and that girdle of the truth 
holds the sword of the word of God. Now that good, valiant, spiritual warrior is identified as a truth bearer. And we know that those people have their steps ordered by God. And it's important to know what that means. You see, he governs our steps. He, he develops truth within us. And when we are established in that truth, God himself takes care that our life becomes one of truthfulness and godliness. He influences our thinking processes and he guides us in the paths of righteousness. And that order is military. It comes from a military thought that there is a pace. If you watch soldiers marching, it's to a, a pace. They're not all wandering about. They're all in line and they're marching to the same beat. If you had an army that just wandered around, you'd have no success at all. Everything has to be focused, marching to the same beat as everyone else. And who is the commander of the army of God? Jesus. He is the one who sets the pace and the beat of our life. And that's what it means, the steps of a good person, a good man, a warrior, valiant in heart and spirit, is ordered by the Lord, the commander orders the step pace of the church so we have a picture here a picture is one of commitment uh, a disciplined person who knows the commander of the army of the lord we know that the truth uh, of christ is the flag under which we we march and we're committed to follow him not trying to lead we we don't make the lead he is the lead and we are the followers and when we speak of leaders, we must understand that it's a small L. If we're doing any form of leadership in the church, it's with a small L. The capital one belongs to Christ. He has to be the leader of the church. He is captain of the host. And we must follow that. And it's so powerful that we do that. These are ordered steps. And I want you to think about that. On a day-to-day -day basis, do we just wander around? Do we just casually do what we want to do and I'm, I'm not speaking against you know the freedom to make choices or uh, do you know something that we find pleasurable I'm not talking about that I'm saying in the innermost being of our hearts are we more God-centered or self-centered and I think that needs constant judgment we need to come to that and examine our hearts regularly we're told in the word that that's a good thing to do examine your heart we want to see that there's no wickedness in us. We've come to God, search me, O oh God, and see if there's anything ungodly in me. We need to have a regular uh, checkup on that. Ordered steps follow truth and righteousness. That's what they do, because he is the author of that. Look at some of these pictures for a moment with those thoughts in mind. Exodus 34, verse 6 says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. If you recognize the character and person of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know that he is the full image of God, you know that righteousness and truth is the way to go. We don't make up our own rules. We don't make up our own ideals. We don't follow our own paths. Now, I'm not saying you can't choose your career path, but it's a good thing to talk to God about all these things. If you set your sights on something and you get a movement in your heart that God is speaking to you, that that's not the way you should go, it's worth examining that. Check it out. Now, there's a little warning sign here. You know, don't run off at the first thought that you have thinking it's God. Search the scriptures, pray a lot. You don't want to be rushing off to do something that you thought was God. You need to let that lie before God and wait on the Lord. If you wait on the Lord, you will renew your strength. And we need to be strong, strong in thought and deed. And in those things, you find yourself walking to the pace by which God is calling you to walk. If you walk, all over the place like a wanderer there's no direction in that at all god brings direction to the steps of those who seek him in earnest if you earnestly seek god you will find him 
So these are the people who walk by faith and not by sight. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 24, we read, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. Uh, for consider what great things he has done for you. It's very important to reflect back on what God has done so far. Thus far, the Lord has brought us. And you raise that banner up. We've got this far by the grace of God. And he has never failed. Therefore, we trust him for the next phase. Listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. He leads us in truth and righteousness. And Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2 says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Those are powerful words. Who abides in your tabernacle, Lord? Those who dwell in in your holy hill are people who walk uprightly and work righteousness. And you, you want to be there in that communion with God. Throughout the scripture, we find it again and again, a call to truth and righteousness. It's right throughout the word of God to do the right thing. And in that word, we are told there is none righteous, not one. Bit of a contrast, isn't it? We have to seek righteousness but there's no one coming to God with their own righteousness. You don't come before the Lord and say, you only need to fix a bit of me because this big big bit here is fine. Thank you very much. You know, I do good things for people. I'm kind. I don't go out of my way to cause trouble. You don't have to deal with that, Lord. I'm coming to you to offer you in my life and I'm bringing these good gifts and I'm laying them out before you for you to go, oh, that's really good. I approve of that. Um, there's got to be a little something wrong with me. You fix that and then I'll be whole. That's not how you get saved and that's not how you live. You don't come to God with all your good, so-called good things and then go, well, that's okay. You don't, you leave me be on that one. I know what I'm doing. You have to come with a whole heart and surrender the whole lot and ask God to renew you. Look at Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, not one. So how do we fare with this? is my question. How do we fare with that? How do you fare with the, that contrast? There's no one righteous because you have to be renewed. If I take you now to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, we come with no righteousness, we confess our ungodliness and our alienation. We come to Christ who knew no sin, but became sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God. Phenomenal. Beyond comprehension. Only God could think of that. And I just encourage you to be valiant for truth. Valiant for for being a warrior of truth and righteousness. Why? Because it reflects on the Lord, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We can live um, comfortably with little changes, but what about the big changes where we have to completely surrender to God and say, search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Truth, truth can then live in us uh, comfortably and then we are one with the Father. And when this truth is in us, it's no longer negotiable. We're not debating this with God. John 8, verse 31 onwards, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, 
you are free indeed. That was a strong point. They went, oh, we're really, we, we've never been in bondage to anyone. He said, but the son hasn't freed you. So you're not really free. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. These amazing words should be treasured in our hearts always, I think. As we seek to be valiant warriors of truth. Listening to the command. This is the way. Walk in it. The steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has said that if he, the Son, makes you free, then you are free indeed, for certain. And the word indeed is an interesting one. It means really. It literally means the word really. <clears throat> Onitos, whom the Son sets free, is really free. Truly, wholly free. And in our freedom... Let us walk as he would have us to walk. Let us speak as he would have us to speak. Let us act as he would have us to act. And when we do, we are his representatives. The steps of a valiant man are under the orders of God. This is the way. Walk in it. Under our general subject of... Uh, steps of a good man next week we're going to look at making sound judgments under the same heading so until then god bless you and uh, walk well